Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame and another dramatic true story about real people. You know, destiny is a moment, a moment of decision, a moment toward which strange and seemingly unconnected events are directed by mightier hands than ours. It is one such decision and the man who made it that we honor tonight as we bring you the true story of Robert Livingston and the Louisiana Purchase. Here now is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. Whether you're looking for a Christmas card to have imprinted with your name, or you want to remember a special friend on a special day, go to a store where Hallmark Cards are sold. At these fine stores across the country, you'll find a wonderful collection of Hallmark Cards to choose from. Cards with new ideas, new designs, and sparkling new colors. Just look for the hallmark and crown on the back of each card you select. The symbol that means you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Mogambo, starring Clark Gable and Ava Gardner with Grace Kelly. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. A Yankee sailing ship nears the end of the long voyage home as the captain and the first mate standing near the helm strain forward to gaze intently at the smudge of land off the port bow. There she is in the horizon, Captain. The port of New Orleans. Home port, Mr. Butler. Welcome words. Captain, I've been watching that ship on our port beam. She's still bearing down on us. Yes, so I've noticed. Spanish man of war, by the look of it. He's almost within hearing distance. Hand me the voice trumpet. I'll warn her off. We have the right of way. Here you are. Spanish man of war! Ahoy! Stand clear! Stand clear! There's her captain at the rail. American mountain sheep! Come about! Come about! The port of New Orleans is closed to all American shipping. Oh, why, that's impossible. This is our home port. This port is now closed to American shipping. What are your orders, sir? Steady as you go. By heaven, I'll not be kept out of home port by politics. They're gun crew, Captain. Naval orders. Right across our bow. That means the next one will... Order, Captain. I tell you, President Jefferson will hear of this. Order, sir. Very well, Mr. Butler. You may come about. An American ship denied admittance to her home port. <laughs> And 4,000 miles away, completely unaware of the incident, two men sit in a fashionable drawing room in Paris, France. One is Monsieur Bob Marbois, Napoleon's Minister of Finance. The other, Robert Livingston, representing the government of the United States in France. But the talk of these two old friends is not of international events or diplomacy. 
Instead, it's about a subject dear to Livingston's heart. Various methods of farming. My dear Livingston, I can't help being amazed that a diplomat should know so much about farming. I'm a farmer first, diplomat second. As a matter of fact, my chief reason in accepting this appointment was the opportunity to study your farming methods over here. Ah, and do you find them different from your own? Oh, I believe the differences are due mostly to geography. Your country is thickly populated, ours isn't. Huh. Transportation is important to us. We must consider not only how to raise crops, but how to distribute what we produce. That means seaports, Livingston. Par ma bois, seaports are vital to the growth of the United States. Take the port of New Orleans, for example. New Orleans? Does your country consider that port vital to you? Why, for us, New Orleans is a gateway to the whole world. As your friend, I'm sorry to hear you say that. Yes, a gateway to the world. But a gate which, unknown to Livingston, has been slammed shut in the face of American ships. And even as he speaks, the back door of the port's being closed, too. A flat boat glides down the Mississippi River loaded with merchandise and raw produce. But as the boat approaches a pier at New Orleans, a Spanish shore patrol warns the boat off. When the tough river men press on, the Spanish reply with a hail of lead. Storm clouds are gathering. There's a whisper of war in the wind. President Thomas Jefferson sends for one of the country's ablest statesmen. James Monroe. James, I've just received bad news. The Spanish have closed the port of New Orleans to us. It's a crippling blow and an intolerable situation for us. Now, what can be done about it, sir? There are those in the Union who say that the answer is war. The war is never an answer. No, I have faith that this problem may be solved by peaceful means, and I want your help. Anything. I'm sending you to Paris to work with Robert Livingston, my minister to France. But why France? It's the Spanish who've closed the port to us. I have information that France and Spain have negotiated a secret treaty by which France regains title to the Louisiana Territory. I see. Then it's Napoleon with whom we'll have to deal. Exactly. I've sent a letter to Livingston instructing him to seek an audience with Napoleon's foreign minister, Talleyrand. Livingston is to inquire, bluntly, if necessary, if France does have title to the territory. And if so? Then, Livingston has been instructed to open negotiations with the French government, leading to the outright purchase of New Orleans, or failing that, to the leasing of adequate port facilities there for our ships. He is authorized to offer up to $2 million for this purpose. I want you to help him conclude the negotiation. I shall leave at once, Mr. President. James, more than one-third of all our shipping has been using the port of New Orleans. We've got to keep it open. For what purpose have you sought an audience with me, Monsieur Livingston? I wish to talk about the port of New Orleans, Monsieur Talleyrand. New Orleans? Why talk to me about his Spanish possession? We have reason to believe that New Orleans no longer is a Spanish possession. What do you mean? Our information is that France once again holds title, not only to New Orleans, but to the entire Louisiana Territory. Ridiculous. You mean the report is not true, then? Monsieur Livingston... I suggest uh, that you and your government concern yourself with your own affairs rather than those of other nations. Control of New Orleans is very much a matter of concern to us. We want to know whether or not the report is true. Very well, it is true. Does that satisfy you? In that case, I am authorized to open negotiations with your government for the purchase of New Orleans or the leasing of port facilities there. There will be no negotiations, Monsieur Livingston. What do you mean? We will shortly be sending ships with soldiers and colonists to Louisiana. Now that the territory is once again a French possession, uh, we intend to make it very much so. But the port of New Orleans is vital to our shipping. Monsieur Livingston, further talk is futile. And I warn you, if your government does not abandon its aspirations for New Orleans, you may be inviting war with France. A flat refusal. Mission apparently doomed to failure. 
Yet such are the workings of diplomacy and intrigue that not even Talleyrand knows of the sudden, strange, and secret decision made by his superior, Napoleon himself, who now lounges comfortably in his spacious bathtub and gazes with amusement at the shocked expression on the face of his brother Joseph, to whom he has just confided his plan. Hey, but surely, well, surely you are joking, Napoleon. My dear brother, I assure you that I am not. Well, then you must indeed be mad. Am I? Oh, the United States, in effect, wishes to buy a look at the moon. But you, Napoleon, would offer them the moon itself. We need money to continue our war against England. My proposal will bring us money. Uh, yeah, of course it will. Consider I... also the British fleet is waiting to pounce upon New Orleans to take it by force. I would much rather have it in the hands of a weaker nation such as the United States. Oh, I know, but what about its loss to us? As to that, when our war with England is won and it is uh, practicable to consider other enterprises, it too would not surprise me to find ourselves able to uh, take back what we had sold. Ah, yes, yes. A shrewd plan indeed, I think. I thought you would. You see, it has always been my observation, Joseph, that if one can view all sides of a situation, can see around the corner, so to speak, then it is entirely possible to have one's cake and eat it too. <laughs> <laughs> would you please hand me my towel? <laughs> In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Isn't it nice to think that Christmas cards are always chosen to make others happy? The warmth, the message, the thoughtfulness that each Christmas greeting brings make the choice of our cards a very important one indeed. That's why I think you'll enjoy selecting yours from the 1953 Hallmark Christmas card albums. You'll not only discover variety, but beauty too among the new Hallmark cards. There are reproductions of paintings by famous artists like Grandma Moses, Norman Rockwell, or Hulda, and a wealth of traditional designs, or modern or religious ones, which capture the spirit of Christmas in a joyous, personal way. So why not plan to visit a fine store where Hallmark cards are sold one day soon? By ordering the Christmas card you want imprinted with your name now, you'll have them at home in plenty of time for leisurely addressing. And you can be sure of it. The hallmark and crown on the back of each card you mail will tell your friends instantly you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Robert Livingston. For Robert Livingston, the moment has not yet come. He voices his disappointment at Talleyrand's refusal to his colleague, James Monroe, who has just arrived from the United States. The worst part of it, Monroe, was that he would not even discuss the matter further. I pointed out that port facilities at New Orleans were vital to the growth and well-being of our country. He flatly refused to negotiate. A bitter blue, Livingston. Yes. When word of the French refusal even to negotiate reaches Washington, the feeling is high there. The president will be instantly besieged by powerful factions who want war. War? You and I have been through one war. A necessary one, a war for our independence. We know something of what war means, the horror of it. Now, to face the possibility of another one, or to face the future as a nation forever crippled, unable to expand, unable to take its place among the great nations of the world, hemmed in by the colonial possession of a foreign power. It's not right. Oh, excuse me. Pardon my 
Au revoir. Good afternoon, leaving, sir. Oh, come in. I can't stay but a moment. Now, this is my colleague from the United States, James Monroe. Monsieur Bob Marbois, French Minister of Finance. Monsieur Monroe. Mm, pleasure, sir. Hey, Livingston, I am come here to ask you to meet me at the finance building tonight at midnight alone. Midnight? Oui. I'm afraid I don't quite understand. I am sorry, but I cannot explain further at this time. Indeed, all the details have not yet been made clear to me as yet, but they will have been by then. I can only say that it is a matter of utmost importance to you and to your country. Now, will you come? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Le bien, until midnight then. Good afternoon, gentlemen. A strange invitation. What do you make of it, Livingston? I don't know. Midnight. Livingston? Bob Marbois. Ah. Very prompt. Now let us go inside. Well, monsieur. My friend, tonight we meet in a different relationship. We are both negotiators on opposite sides of the table. Negotiators? Now, wait. Do you mean the port of New Orleans? Has Napoleon reconsidered? More than that. Napoleon proposes to sell to you the entire Louisiana territory. The entire? What did you say? You had a right. Not only New Orleans, but the entire territory. You have some idea of its boundaries. Yes, yes, I do. It's a vast amount of land. Thousands and thousands of square miles. Très bien. Is your government interested in this proposal? Why, uh... Yes, certainly. We can at least open negotiations between us. The entire territory. <laughs> A bolt from the blue, this sudden offer. Never has Livingston in his wildest imagination conceived such a thing. The entire Louisiana Territory for sale. Almost as if in a dream he opens negotiations with Bob Marbois. The price is discussed. Then Livingston asks for time. He spends the rest of the night pacing up and down and turning the proposal over in his mind and praying for guidance. The next morning, as Bob Marbois waits in the next room for the decision, Livingston tells Monroe of the new development. The entire territory for sale, Monroe. Do you realize what this means? At one stroke, the size of the United States could be doubled. I... I don't know what to say, Livingston. It... It staggers the imagination. But uh, you were authorized to negotiate for lease or purchase of New Orleans only. But no one dreamed an empire would be offered us a vast new frontier. What is the price? Uh, we negotiated for hours. The price is now final. $15 million. $15 million? Well, there isn't that much money in Washington. Uh, Livingston, what are you thinking of? It, it's out of the question. It, it's impossible even to consider. Is it impossible? Well, you know as well as I that you are authorized to spend a maximum of two million dollars. Uh, where would the rest of the money come from? I don't know. Well, then. Perhaps a bond issue. There must be some way. But how can you speak for Congress? It would take three months to get a reply from them by ship. All the more reason why we must not hesitate. James, all you say may be true. And yet, here, right in our very hands, is a tremendous future for our country. I sincerely believe that we have been guided to this moment. I believe God has presented us with this opportunity, that he will find a way to work it out. Robert, you, as senior diplomat, must act on your own. The decision, one way or the other, is yours to make. I know. I know. Bob Marbois? Yes, Livingston. Do you have an answer for me? I think so. Have you the document? Oui, right here. I'll put it on the table and you will sign, huh? Uh, forgive me, monsieur. This is a heavy decision to rest upon the shoulders of one man. 
I must have another moment to think. To think. It's out of the question. It's impossible even to consider. At one stroke, the size of the United States would be doubled. Where would the rest of the money come from? There must be some way. But how can you speak for Congress? I believe God has presented us with this opportunity that he will find a way to work it out. The decision, one way or the other, is yours to make. Yours. 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 Livingston? Hmm? Livingston? Oh, yes, monsieur. You still hesitate? Give me the pen. Eh bien. Here you are. So, Robert Livingston rises to his moment of destiny. He signs the document. But his story is not yet over. When he finally returns to Washington, he is sent for by President Jefferson. A presidential secretary greets him. Uh, Mr. Livingston, to see President Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Robert Livingston? Yes, the president sent for me. I'm aware of that. You just returned from Paris, I believe. I arrived in Washington yesterday. Uh, the news of your negotiation arrived ahead of you. I believe it was uh, $15 million of the government's money that you spent. Yes. Well, we find it quite interesting, Mr. Livingston, that you gave yourself authority to spend more money than there is in the treasurer of the United States. We? Oh, yes. You can be sure that congressmen have been discussing your maneuver for some time. I take it you don't approve. Well, it's not up to me to decide, sir. But I can assure you that there are many influential people in Washington who question your saneness. Does that include the president? The president's opinion is his own affair. But I, for one, feel you went quite beyond your authority. And if you think the Congress will support your extravagance, then I warn you to be on your guard. Robert. Mr. President. Well, come in, come in. Uh, will you uh, be needing me, Mr. President? No. Sit down, Robert. Thank you, sir. It's good of you to come so quickly. You, uh, <clears throat> you wish to talk about the Louisiana Territory? Yes. Robert, many years ago, you and I both served on a committee which considered what was to be the nature of a certain document. A document which I later wrote. The Declaration of Independence. You have served your country long and well, but now... Yes, sir. Now, Robert, you have done something which, in my opinion, surpasses by far all your past contributions. You... You mean you approve, sir? I mean... I congratulate you on the tremendous step you have taken in the service of your country. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Oh, rest assured, we'll have a fight on our hands. Congress must ratify the document you signed, and that means stormy sessions ahead. I know. But yours has been an act of faith. Faith in God. Faith in the future of your country. Faith in yourself. Your decision was based upon that faith. And it is my firm conviction that history will prove you to be right. On October the 31st, 1803, just 150 years ago, next Saturday, after lengthy and fierce debate, the Congress of the United States confirmed Livingston's judgment and ratified the Louisiana Purchase and authorize the floating of a bond issue to finance it. Yes, and overnight, the United States found a new and shining destiny. And what was this territory our nation gained by a stroke of the pen? All or part of 17 states, from Alabama to Montana, from Louisiana to Minnesota, west from the mighty rolling Mississippi, to the thundering cataracts of the Rockies, north from the Gulf of Mexico to the very borders of Canada, 900,000 square miles, 
half a billion acres of the rich, fertile heart of America. And the price? Four cents per acre. <laughs> yes, all of this because of the decision of one man, a man of destiny, a man of great vision and great courage, Robert Livingston, the man who made the Louisiana Purchase. the Hallmark Hall of Fame, we are going to honor a truly remarkable woman. A woman of amazing personal courage who defied all opposition and marched right into the front lines of a war. Yes, she was a woman whose true adventures will hold your interest right from the start. I'll tell you more about her in a moment. But first, my friend Frank Goss here has some good advice he wants to pass on. Last week, my newly married niece called me and said, Uncle Frank, I've just discovered Hallmark Christmas cards in boxes. They're beautiful, and what a help to our budget. Be sure and tell people about them soon. Well, her enthusiasm was contagious, so tonight I want to suggest that you take a look at the Hallmark cards in boxes the next time you shop. You'll be pleasantly surprised, I know, because these economical assortments are varied and really distinctive. For instance... You can choose from reproductions of paintings by well-known artists like Norman Rockwell or Hulda, or you can have boxed Hallmark cards with messages by Reverend Norman Vincent Peale, noted author and churchman. Best of all, they cost as little as one dollar a box for four designs in a set of 12. You'll also find big thrifty boxes of 25 different Hallmark Christmas cards for just one dollar. You'll be smart to have a few extra boxes on hand for last-minute addressing. And remember, the hallmark and crown on the back of each card you mail will carry an added measure of joy. For it means you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Frank, you mentioned a man for whom I have a very healthy respect. And that's Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. I'm delighted to hear that he's written special Christmas messages for Hallmark cards. I've always enjoyed his writing in his newspaper column, and I don't know when I've read a more inspiring or helpful book than Dr. Peel's The Power of Positive Thinking. And now, I'm sure that lots of people will enjoy his moving words this Christmas on Hallmark Christmas cards, just as I'm sure all of you will enjoy our story next week. Uh, tell us uh, a little more about uh, Mary Ann Bickerdyke, Frank. At the time of the Civil War, Mary Ann Bickerdyke was a member of the Ladies' Aid in Galesburg, Illinois. One day she set off with a trainload of supplies for our Civil War troops. And what happened makes a really exciting adventure story. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having all of you with us next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday, starring Miss Sarah Churchill. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our script tonight by Robert Wright. Robert Livingston, played by Whitfield Connor, featured in our cast, William Conrad, Ben Wright, Herb Butterfield, William John Stone, Alan Reed, Joseph Kearns, and Ted DeCorsia. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next week, we honor Mary Ann Bickerdyke on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.